This meeting is being recorded. Oh, there's something new now. It's also a verbal thing telling me the meeting is recorded. <laughs> Very good. And uh, let me share my screen, my book with you. I don't need to share the screen, just the book. Share sounds. Okay, share. Let me just with this, I bet the size of it so we can all read. Guys, remind you all that uh, this is not a lecture, this is a study. So please feel free to interrupt anytime. Please feel free to make your comments, questions, suggestions, share your experiences, because this is what makes this study profitable, I would say. So we have stopped in item three. We would ask if there is someone amongst the inhabitants who is the cause of the phenomena due to the spontaneous and involuntary mediumship. That is always necessary because if such is not the case, these incidents cannot happen. A spirit lives in a place of its own choosing. As long as there is no one there whom it can use, it remains inactive. But when such a person appears, it entertains itself as much as it can. We have discussed already about that, right? So to have raps, noises, things like that in a place, we do need to have a medium of physical effect not too far from there. And mainly, what comes to my mind is that People think that is someone that's very close to them. Let's say we live in a building. Not necessarily are these phenomena are connected to someone that lives in that flat. Could be someone on the flat next door because of the proximity, all right? And another thing that came to my mind here is that when we are facing a phenomena like that, we have a need of a medium not far from there to allow that to happen. Likewise, TCI is the transcommunication, also needs a medium of physical effect. And when something changes, like it did change in a center in Brazil not too long ago, Sometimes the, even the work, the ectoplasmic work stops or that modality of ectoplasmic work stops because not everyone is the same. Not every medium of physical effects have the same possibilities either. So there isn't one medium like another. Like we all human beings are different and at the same time, pretty much the same, mediumship is also like that. We may all be a certain type of medium, but with a different characteristics. Hi, Sandra. Hello. So I have a question, sorry. I'm not quite sure if I understood the meaning of the word on the last sentence, entertain. We have to remember that at that time, when Kardec was writing that, there was pretty much the sense of the word entertain, making noise and making fun, having a party, having a saloon full of people to watch the phenomena, right? And when the way he, he describes here is like the spirit is there. He, he wants to have fun. He wants to annoy the person that lives there or whatever, but he never had the opportunity. So now that he have an opportunity to have a medium of physical effects in the vicinity. So now he will entertain himself or others making noises, fun, etc. Does it make sense for you, Sandra? Thank you. Cool. Four is the presence of this person in place itself indispensable? Normally, yes. And that is the case in this particular situation. That is why I said that these incidents could not be happening otherwise. But I do not mean to generalize. 
There are, in fact, cases where the medium's presence in the place itself is not necessary. How to understand that? Is necessary or not? As ever, nothing is cast in stone. There are so many variations of the same phenomena. There are so many variations of the medium's characteristics that would be unwise to say yes or no. That's why we had that answer from the spirits. Gil, sorry, it's Christine. Hi, Christine. Hello, everyone. Um, would that be an example of where it says um, there are, in fact, cases where the medium's presence in the place itself is not necessary, where um, there's recordings of noises of, if you like, places that people don't feel comfortable in because they feel they can sense, even though they're not a medium, they can sense that there's there's something happening there or, or they hear a noise or there's recordings of noises. Is that, is that a sort of what we're talking about here? Yeah, it's one of the possibilities, yes. I will give another example because I think it will be easier to understand to all of us. When we go to a spirit center to have healing passes in some countries, is it stronger face to face than from distance? It is different. It is different. When we are face to face, is a directly donation of fluids from one person to another. The distance basically non-existent. But can we do healing from distance? Yes, we can. But how can we do that? We have to be trained to do that. We have to be familiar with that. It's not just like thinking and it's happening. We have to have a strong will. We need to have spirits willing to help us to do that from distance. And it's possible. So the same thing, I believe, applies to what he's saying here. It's way easier to manipulate the ectoplasm, the energy, if the medium and the spirits are in the same place. Can we bring ectoplasm from somewhere else to this room? Yes. But it will be a bit more complicated. We need to have people who knows how to do that, right? So commonly the medium and the spirits are in the same vicinity, but it can happen not frequently that the medium that is donating ectoplasm to do those raps, to do those noises is not there directly. Right. Did I help you, Christina, or did I make things worse? You're right on the ball, Gil. Good. <laughs> Good. Since such spirits are of a lower order, is the aptitude for serving as the auxiliary and unfavorable assumption about the individual? Does it indicate an affinity for beings of this nature? Not exactly, because this aptitude results from a physical disposition. Nevertheless, it is almost always indicates a materialistic tendency that would preferably not exist because the more morally evolved a person is, the more he or she attracts good spirits who necessarily repel the evil ones. Mm, I, I don't remember if it was on this study here or there was elsewhere, but we have spoken about lower order and evil. We need to make a, we need to understand well both situations. We are, lower order spirits. We all are lower order spirits, right? 
Let's make that very clear. There's no angels here. But I don't believe we are evil. We may have one hidden here, I don't know, but I prefer to believe that none of us are evil. When we understand lower order as degrees of evolution, and when we understand that as we evolve, our peri spirit becomes lighter and lighter, means that if I'm the top notch spirit on that scale, my peri spirit does not have what is required to interact with our matter. In that case, I will ask help from a lower order spirit to be able to do that phenomenon. Let, let's say that, uh, choose one, let's say Jesus, because it's the top notch, right? Jesus wants to do a intervention or he wants to make a, a table turn, but he's so elevated that to him, to do something like that, it'd be very painful to lower his vibration, to acquire density enough to intervene in the table. So he will come to Daniel, for example. Daniel, I need your hand. Can you please move that table? Here we go. He'll move the table. He does not make him evil. Make him someone that his characteristics at that moment in time is required to move the table. Saying that, I'm not eliminating evil spirits to do the phenomena. They can also do the phenomenon, right? So we have to split both. The mechanism is the same. The first case where I use Jesus and Daniel as example is I elevated spirits asking assistance for less elevated spirits to make the table. But the mechanic mechanism behind is the same, to move the table. We need that type of matter to move our matter. So the medium and the spirits, they have the dense fluid required to move that table. On the case number two, where we're talking about evil spirits, are using exactly the same mechanism, but they don't need to lower their vibration because they're already low. So they can do that directly without the intervention of another spirit. So they will use themselves, their own possibilities, and the possibilities of a medium to make it happen. Any questions? Yep. Hey, Gil, it's Christine again. Um, I don't know if I've talked about it here, but I've certainly talked about it in a spiritism class about overshadowing, the effects of overshadowing. Um, could that be an example of where, um, well, an evil spirit could overshadow a incarnate? Or would it be that, well, I wouldn't think a higher order spirit would want to overshadow an incarnate because what would be the purpose? Christine, first I need your help. I, I don't know what overshadow means or what is the equivalent. Can you explain to me how this phenomena, please? Um, I was told it was called overshadowing. I, was, I had an experience where I was walking down the road. I was going for a walk, like in my normal walk every day before work. And I was dressed in my uh, walking clothes and then I, all of a sudden, I was looking through a different set of eyes and I was dressed as a man in the 19, I estimated when I was trying to work out what had happened in the 1940s. But I didn't look around, I just was looking at the ground. 
And someone told me that was called overshadowing. One spirit overshadows another. It only, it only happened for a matter of seconds, but that's what I was told it was called. Uh, I don't know if that's possible. I, I really don't know, right? And uh, what comes to my mind is the phenomena called double view. And, or second view, when your perispirit, your own perispirit, kind of detach from your body for a period of moment, period of time, and then you have a recollection of what used to be or what is around of you. I, I don't recall any phenomena that one spirit would have his imprint into an incarnated to make him like you described. I, I really don't know. What comes to my mind is that double view and I will ask help from Charles Amunir, please. <laughs> what do you guys think? Uh, it is not an easy question, indeed. No, I don't. The only thing that comes to my mind is that double view, right? We have every memory of our past lives within our mnemonic archives. They are, let, let me explain that, is our hard drive in our perispirit not in our physical body, in our perispirit. So it's the hard, hard drive that we have all the lives over there. Thank you, Damien. I was going to say that I was even going to mention Life and Destiny, the book by Leon Denis. And he explains very much like that. And there is a very interesting case there, a woman, she forgot her present language, which was French. And she started to speak a language she used to speak until she was five. So we see that, you know, it's possible to bring back memories mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, to evoke memories from our own uh, minds. So, you know, perhaps this yeah. was the case. I, we have situations where we can access this hard drive, this past memories, right? It can happen when we are awakened, not very often, but it can. And it happens more often when we are sleeping. Normally, we differentiate those memories from dreams because dreams, we lose them very quickly. And they are something that make no sense at all. When we have some glances of the past, that imprint remains longer with us like you had that, I don't know when that happened, but it was not now. So you, you had like an imprint in your present memory and you feel like, no, that's not a dream. I saw that, I, I, I leave that. So then we make a difference between dreams and access to our hard drive like that. Hi Liz, I see your hand. Hi there everyone. Um, I would tend to call it um, more of a reality shift, um, especially in these times, because as our planet is actually progressing from third density to fourth de density now with the incoming wave. Um, we're going to see more of these things happen. Um, friends of mine, actually, I can give an example. We're sitting in a kitchen, in their kitchen, around the table. Um, some of them saw somebody come in, a girl come in and introduce herself and sit at the table, and others didn't in the same room. So there's an example of a reality shift. Another one is we've been warned which will happen is um, in some cases you could go into the supermarket and end up in another country. It's a reality shift and it can be very, very confusing. But we've been warned that this is likely to happen more now um, as 
our density progresses? I I really do not know. I, I honestly do not know. Uh, I cannot even say it's possible, not possible. I don't know. I really don't know. Only one thing that uh, came to my mind, Liz, when you were talking is that I can have 10 different mediums with the characteristics of, with the possibility to see the spirits in the room. Only one may see the spirits coming. And then I have a second spirit coming to the room. The medium that saw the first spirit may not see the second one. And then another two mediums may see the second one because it all is related to the fluids, to the ties that the medium may create with the spirits. Of course, there are mediums that will see every spirit because he has a ability to do so. He has the physical characteristics to do so. But even knowing some of medium, some mediums that had a broader capacity to see spirits, they also told me that they don't see all the spirits. So, um, but I, back to what I start saying, I, I don't know. Is that something that we'll see more often or not? I, I don't know. There is no record about that in the spiritism. There is no reference of that in the spiritism. Is it possible? <laughs> Yeah, go on. So, well, perhaps because this is something in the future, but the example I gave um, in the kitchen, they were sitting around for breakfast. It was a person in real life that entered the room, not a spirit. Uh, oh, I see, I see. And also um, a case of having two caps. Um, one of the people sitting there also had a cap and um, another cap appeared identical, you know? Yeah. This is something that is beyond what I know. And uh, I never experienced anything like that. So I really, I really don't know. And I, thinking like that, out of the blue, I don't remember finding an explanation in the spiritism for that. Not like, not like that, I don't remember. Maybe, maybe, maybe that is, there's a lot. It's impossible to know everything that's written in Kardec's work, to be honest, it's impossible. People think it's just uh, five books and it's not. There's a lot of, well, 16 or 17 magazine reviews and uh, spiritist reviews and there are other books. So I, I, I think it's virtually impossible to know everything that's there. At least I, I don't, but to everything I saw so far, I don't, I cannot make a connection. I cannot make a connection. But I'm always willing to learn something different. So yes, it is a very attractive subject. But uh, how can I explain that with the spiritism? I don't know. But I truly believe that the spiritism is not cast in stone. And as Kardec said, the spiritism needs to evolve with science. If science can bring that to us, if give us at least an opportunity to start to evaluate those processes, it is our duty as a spiritists to try to understand and to follow. I remember now that I saw years ago, uh, I think on YouTube or internet, I don't remember anymore, cases of similarity of what you explained. And there was even one article about a whole ship that in theory has been moved from place A to place B. In that was the Philadelphia experiment. Yeah, yeah, this one. And, but if there is enough data to evaluate that, we don't have access to those data. And that's yeah. a shame. It would be very nice if you could have data for those events, because that would perhaps prove what we believe that could give us more information to make better questions, at least. But uh, because when we're talking about the spiritual world, what is it? It's a world in a different dimension. They interact with ours. And that perhaps would help us a lot. But uh, I, I, as I said, I know very little, not enough to discuss about that.
So can I just say that this experience I had was about 25 years ago and I went on to do some family and found that the walk that I was going in the street I lived, one of my relatives' ancestors lived in the same street. And when this experience happened, it was near the house that they lived in. I didn't know that I lived in the same street as one of my distant um, with what, with what you are saying, I would even take a chance to say that perhaps your past relative is not too distant from what you are today. Perhaps was even you, right? Because we know that quite often we return to the same group or the same family. So perhaps, I'm just saying once again, perhaps, you had a glance of what you had. You, you had like a deja vu, if you like. You had a deja vu of yourself in that time in, in age, walking through. And as you perhaps were living in that area or nearby that house or whatever, that deja vu just came to you. And, but the most important to retain from those experiences when you do have access to that level of information, it's for a purpose. It's never without any reason. There's always a purpose. So basically, maybe there was a wake up call. Maybe there was something that would drive you to make a decision or not make a decision, or there was something to prevent you to make something wrong, right? Because we have a mechanism to forget our past incarnations when we are incarnated. And this remains when we are discarnated. When we are discarnated, we don't have access to the whole hard drive. And the reason not to have access to the whole hard drive is because we would not support the atrocities we committed a thousand years ago, for example. So we only have access to what is required to our evolution. So if you do have an experience like that, try to find the positive meaning of it because you will not have access to that information for a different reason. Even if you are feeling that, oh, I, I'm in a, in a scene where Everyone is killing everyone. I just had, I felt like I was killing 10 people in that room. Yes, perhaps you were in that picture at that time and you had access to that picture today, for example, to prevent you to do the same or to prevent you to go to those places where this type of situations may occur. So when we do have a glance like that, let's try always to find the positive outcome or that experience. We don't have that experience for nothing, right? Well, that's pretty good study, you see? I love it. So let's move on. And where does the spirit go in search of the objects it utilizes? It is almost always fine. These objects in the place itself or in the vicinity a force that proceeds from the spirit fleeing, then through the air and cause them to fall wherever they wish. I, I did a research, something like what, 10 years ago? I was pretty much into physical effects and I was searching left and right. And I found registers of sciences of, of meetings with physical effect mediums, well-known physical effect mediums, where a lot of things were brought from outside of a hermetic room. What is an hermetic room? Nothing can get in or can get out physically from that room. They have tested all possibilities and they were sure that 
wouldn't be possible, for example, to slide something under the door to get into the room, just an, as an example. And the spirits, they brought things from even different countries. How you know it's from different countries? Because those type of flowers could not be found in the hot climate, for example. They would only be found in Holland, for example. They brought different things. Not, I, I gave flower as an example, but they brought different things to the room. And that time was that kind of experience was required to kind of convince people of the phenomena. Nowadays, I don't know if it still exists or if it does exist, it's not a lot. The last recollection I have was one institution back in Brazil that something like six years ago was stopped because the medium died. But through my research, I, uh, I was making questions to the spirits because through the books, I still had questions. I, I could not find enough information to calm my heart, if I can say like that. So I did ask one spirit that was part of those experiments, how was possible to bring something from outside into the room. Of course, my limitation to understand was also playing how he was trying to answer to me. And he explains to me that he evolved, evolved whatever he wants to bring to the room in his peri spirit. And that was the mechanism that allows him to pass through the walls, through the doors with a object. Make sense? It does. Because if I'm, if my peri spirit allows me to pass through, if I'm involving the object with my fluids, with my peri spirit, for a period of moment, the object will also acquire the same characteristics, able to pass through the walls, like, you know? And then the answer was sufficient to me. Hi, Liz. Hi there. Um, regarding um, shifting something physical through a physical wall or a hermetically sealed room, I would have thought they would have done um, a demolecularization and remolecularization process on that. I thought that as well. Yeah. And uh, the explanation I had was to make it happen, the level of energy required was tremendous. And we're talking about atomic level of energy. And yeah. that's why I let it go, right? But I taught that as well, because there are some books that mention that we disintegrate the matter to reintegrate the matter. And it makes things more complicated. This is how people teleport as well. I never, I never did that yet. After I do, I'll let you know. But I hope <laughs> the day comes, I'll be 100% myself on the other side as well. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah. The, I think that eventually we'll be able to understand better energies into the molecular level. And then perhaps we can create theories behind that. But today, I never found anything that was sufficient, to me at least, to consider as a theory, right? I truly think that one day we'll be astonished by what can, can be happening in our homes day to day, you know? You perhaps you don't need to get a train to go to work anymore, you know, you had a... I, I truly believe something like that could be possible, but that's just me thinking. I have no support for it. And I remember that uh, when I was a kid, the Jetsons is a, is a cartoon from, from US where they had 
flying cars, they, they worked from home. They, there was something that would be unthinkable 40 years ago, 50 years ago. And here we are, we are here, everyone in a different place talking through the computer, you know. They are flying cars already under the market. If you have money enough to buy, you can buy one. So yeah, who knows? You would have been able to do that had we been able to progress with Tesla's energy and his methods of utilizing energy, free energy, without you know the physical limitations that we have now. The other thing is um, teleportation may be a little bit different from by location, where people can be in two places at the same time. I know um, um, Sheikh Nazim here from the Sufis, he used to be able to lecture here in North Cyprus, but also be with people in the Hajj in Mecca at the same time, and people could witness that or also speak at Glastonbury and still be here. I, I, I can relate to what you said as a mediumship phenomenon. Teletransportation, if comes one day, is a totally different phenomenon, or not phenomenon, is a mechanism. Hi, Charles. Charles, your mic is closed. I'm just answering, sorry, I'm just answering to the previous question. How does uh, the spirit bring uh, some object uh, through the doors and the walls and so on? Huh? And uh, Cardex is explaining it uh, in item 99, just a little bit uh, down in the, in the book. And there it's clearly written that he, what, what you told, He's, he's uh, uh, enveloping the object with uh, his fluid plus the fluid of the medium. Huh? And then he can bring it through the, through the walls. And by removing this envelope, the, op the object appears again. So he's, he's uh, bringing some explanation on that. And uh, with regards to Lee's uh, remarks, the teletransportation, huh? There is a famous case uh, in, in the American literature, even before Kardec, huh, of, uh, I don't remember his name. He was uh, transported uh, something like uh, 30 miles away uh, instantaneously. Uh, he was in the city and then he was found uh, in the mountains uh, 25 miles away. And it's probably the same type of uh, mechanism which is uh, acting in this case. Also, yeah, we also have cases of apportation, don't we, where our items disappear and can be found in the washing machine or different places, but they can disappear for, you know, from one day to months. Sometimes we don't even find them, but they have been lifted. Yes. But the apport is something related to the mediumship characteristic. Apport is in line with what Charles just said. The fluid envelops whatever it is and take from place A to place B. Uh, through my research, Charles, when I was looking after Peixo Chinho, he's a medium, there was the strongest medium effects medium in Brazil. He, he used to do science where his body started to reduce, to shrink through the science. And one time became like a goo, like a little ball of matter only during the science. So he was donating ectoplasm for the materialization of spirits and his physical body was shrinking, okay? When the science was ending, then his physical body started to be reintegrated. In that situation, what I found that put me to rest, if you like, was that the level of ectoplasm donation was so great that the atomic level of his cells were compacting to the point that it became like a little ball of anything. But after that energy returned to his physical body, it regained the physical appearance as he was known. There was in the lecture, literature, 
a case where mediums were totally disintegrated from a place to another. But I could not find anything to, to give support to, to them start to create a theory behind that. I, I did, never did, but uh, we had that in the, in the spiritist literature. Hi, Munir. Hi, good evening. Just, just to add on that, we, we have two different situations when you have you know, an inert object being altered and you have an organic body being altered because we have physiological functions as well. So I think it's even more complicated. But well, when we study, when we study the atom, for instance, there are certain phenomena on atomic level that is almost like that. For instance, when the electrons they change layer, they go from you know one um, orbit to another. What happens in between? They just disappear from one and appear on another orbit. There's no in between. You know, oh, he takes this way and gets that. There's also a phenomenon that's, that is uh, very much used nowadays and is uh, it's called the quantum tunneling. When a particle just disappears from one region and appears in another region, that is accepted. No one questions what happens in between. There's no in between, you know, there's A and B. So it's basically you see, well, you know, we you know, know before, we know after, but what happens in between? You know, it remains a, a question mark to show that, you know, on atomic level, we have already and it's accepted already that, you know, some particle, material particles, they may disappear from one place and appear on, on another place. But, you know, on larger scale, on, uh, you know, uh, in the micro, a macro world, I think, you know, it's, it becomes more complicated, especially when there are physiological uh, functions involved in that. Charles? Yes, so the, sorry, uh, my memory is sometimes a little bit uh, weak, but I found it, uh, this uh, transportation case is with Andrew Jackson Davis, and it's uh, in Arthur Conan Doyle's book, huh, History of Spiritualism, and it happened in uh, 6th of March, 1844, huh? where uh, he has been, uh, his whole physical body has been transported uh, 40 miles away. away. Uh, but when you talked about Pechotinho, uh, this reminds me uh, what uh, Aksakov is also saying. Huh? There is uh, the medium giving ectoplasm. He, he could observe uh, uh, partial de uh, dematerialization of his arm or of some of his organism. And this is coming from the fact uh, he is uh, donating uh, the ectoplasm. Uh, William Crookes also measured that in some cases uh, the weight of the body of the medium can be halved, uh, going to half. Uh, and, and so this is one thing. It may be linked, anyhow, this ectoplasm, uh, the fluid is necessary for throwing the stones and for transporting and for everything. So it's probably a link between both. But uh, I think we have to, to make the difference between the medium itself giving ectoplasm and the stone or whatever, and any other object which is transported uh, through uh, the matter. Huh? Yes. Uh, as per the other uh, experiment done also by Zöllner in Germany in Leipzig, he had uh, two annals huh, done of different uh, type of wood. And after the mediumic session, the annals were found uh, one into the other, and there was absolutely no sign of him being cut and glued and whatever. So uh, his conclusion was also that uh, the, 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 the matter went through the matter in order to achieve uh, that phenomenon. Oh, you mean rings, by the way, annals, rings. Yeah. Yes, rings. rings yeah, no, it's rings. just clarifying in case. Ah, yeah. Okay, sorry. Uh, we, we had here Anna Paula saying that about bilocation. Yeah, bilocation is, we can find that in the spiritism. And the subject of things moving back and forth, you know, and energy is really, it's really incredible. And I think that uh, to many people, they think, oh, they are crazy, totally crazy. You know, they are talking, but uh, 
We cannot listen to them. But if you want to do a thorough research, you still can find people, even from Peixotinho time alive. I know some of them. And even his daughters, they are alive and they live in my hometown. And uh, as ever, we are not here to convince anyone, right? But if you want to find more about it, especially nowadays with the internet, you can also find a lot of reliable sources where you can increase your own knowledge. Since a spontaneous, what time is it? I forgot the time. Oh no, we still have a couple of minutes. Since a spontaneous manifestations are often allowed an even cause for the purpose of convincing disbelievers, it seems to us that if some of these individuals were themselves they target, they would be forced to yield to the evidence. People often complain of not having witnesses, conclusive facts. Wouldn't it depend on the spirits to provide them with appreciable proof, appreciable proof? Oh dear, look at the answer, it's long. Don't atheist and materialist witness at every moment the effect of the power of God and of thought. Mm. He start to answer in a big style. But this does not prevent them from denying both God and the soul. Did the miracle of Jesus convert all his contemporaries? Didn't the Pharisee who said to him, Master, show us a sign, resemble those who today ask you to show them manifestations? If they fail to be convinced by the marvels of creation, they will be no more affected by the appearance of spirits, even if they appear in the most obvious manner, because the, these individuals' pride has transformed them into a stubborn muse. They would have plenty of opportunities to witness if they sought such opportunities in good faith. That is why God does not deem to appropriate to do more for them than for what God has already done for those who sincerely seek to educate themselves. Because God only reward persons of goodwill. They disbelief will not impede the fulfillment of the divine will. You have already seen that it has not hindered the expansions of the doctrine. So do not concern yourselves with the opposition, which is to the doctrine what a shadow is to the painting. It lends it greater relief. What would be the merit if they had to be convinced by force. God leaves to them their responsibility for their own stubbornness. And this responsibility is heavier than you think, than you might think. Fortunate are those who believe without having seen, said Jesus, because they do not doubt the power of God. Nice test and in simple words, don't try to convince anyone because you're wasting energy. If the person for any reason decide to learn something, then it's different. Then it's our obligation to give them munition to find where you may find this answer, to find where you may be exposed to that experience. But other than that, the prime example is not even Jesus were able to convince everyone. So why do you think you will? Not a chance. Gil, it's Christine again. I guess just to summarize that last bit of text that you read, at the end of the day, when it's our turn to leave, that's when we know what what we, we didn't want to believe or we were a stubborn mule, and I can think of a few of those, um, we'll, we'll understand. But we all have to go through that ourselves. So that's what I'm getting from that passage that you just read. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
there is one thing that came to my mind, Liz. I used to say, joking with people, that when you die, you will see if what I'm telling is true or not. I used to joke like that. But the process showed me otherwise. Sometimes when we speak with the spirits, they died for decades and they don't even realize they are dead. Sometimes they passed away a couple of years for a couple of years and they still think they are there. Same situations are continuing. So, hi Charles. Yes, fully agree. And uh, I think one thing we can be sure is from the moment we are ready to accept such reality, the phenomenon, they come uh, automatically, I would say. The spirit, they give, uh, they do what is necessary for you to be in contact with the phenomenon, okay? So this is, this is uh, uh, exactly what uh, Guilherme is telling. There are some people, you, it's totally useless to show them the phenomenon. You even contradict them they will be angry against you and whatever. And even after they die, you are totally, uh, uh, said it totally uh, right, Guilherme. They continue in front of the evidence uh, denying it. This is simply the, the effect of the pride huh? and mm -hmm. only the time can heal that. And something came to my mind, Charles, is that even in the spiritism centers, yeah, people create theories and they want to believe and they live that. Sometimes when we face some people, we even ask from where this person is taking that theory, you know, from where is coming that difference, those rules and things like that, you know, because we are humans, we are evolving and we have a long past where we had so many boundaries, we had so many rules created even by others that we incorporated and we live by then. So there's only one thing, in my opinion, that would change that, is the example. Practice an example. And eventually we know that everyone will arrive at the same point. So at that moment in time, I hope we all share the same experiences, but we are far from there. Do you think it would be appropriate to evoke that spirit in order to ask it for a few explanations? Evoke, evoke it if you want, but it is of a low order and it is answer will be quite insignificant. Evoke an spirit. I would ask why. Because you don't know who the spirits that's coming to answer you. Maybe him, maybe not. Hi, Charles. Yes, in fact, he did it. You see, uh, item 95 is evocating the spirit. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so Kardec was, how to say, investigator. Uh, okay, mm -hmm. let's go, let's ask him. Because uh, one thing Kardec always did is before evoking a spirit, he asks to the mentors, can I evoke that spirit? Uh, this is a precondition which is uh, very, very uh, good to, to follow still today. Since he told if evoke it if you want to, then it okay, so let's evoke it. Mm -hmm. huh? And uh, without any illusion to get something transcendental. Huh? Uh, so that is what we will see, I think, next week. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I saw, where was it? I saw a show where there was a TV show, people evoking spirits. They were, I think that was a long time ago. I think they were in someone's house where they got together and they decided to evoke spirits. 
I, I think there are risks doing that. As Charlie says, no, yeah, it's a different thing. You are in the organized meeting with the benefactors you are familiar with. That's a different thing. Look, look the answer to question number two just below. <laughs> yeah, that, that's <laughs> exactly what you told, but it's for next week. No. Yeah, I won't, you won't have time today, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, that was very nice. And I, I, I love when we have a study that we participated, we share experience, opinion, bring things that are different because that's the best way to all of us to evolve, to make reason of the information you may have today. So I would thank you all for the study today. I will stop our recording now. And